this primary concerns in home care? Because I know the agencies are having all kinds of issues. If you're just getting started, some are having trouble finding the right employees or whatever. So I wanted to just cover some of those things today. So first I wanted to talk about hiring and a few of you have mentioned already about finding employees. And then I've heard a lot about once you find an employee, are they reliable? You know, they call you and say, I would like to work for your company. I'm a CNA or I'm a caregiver and I'm available for this many hours. But then they won't come in and finish all the paperwork or they won't bring you their TV test or not do the orientation. So that's time that you spend that is not productive for you. Right. And then I've had some to say they've hired the person, the person gave them all the paperwork, did everything, and they gave them the assignment to go to work and they didn't show up on the first day. Yes. <laughs> so that is hard to me, that's heartbreaking. Because uh -huh. <laughs> you know, you've shared all the information because what I did with, with my aides is whoever the nurse was that did the assessment, we would give report to the aid, telling them everything we knew about the client and the house and you know, and all of that, the environment. And so you've given them all that information. You may have talked to them at nine o'clock last night and they were supposed to be at work at 10 this morning and the client calls and said, no one showed mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So that's a really hard one, but I'm hearing that it's happening more and more. Yeah, it is. And then I've also heard that because now most agencies have to do electronic visit, even if they are on Medicaid, they have to electronically clock in, clock out and put in their tasks. And a couple of agency owners have said they had employees that left the agency because they just could not adapt to having to enter that information on a phone or however they had to do it. They were near retirement or they went into another field, but they just left the agency. So that's a challenge getting these people oriented to the new technology that have never done it that way before. And then finding the right employee for the right job. <clears throat> There's a few considerations here. I have quite a few agencies that say they can't find a nurse. They want to do in-home aid services, which requires a registered nurse. And so some opt to do companion center services because they can't find a nurse, so they just do companion care. But we all know that if you bring a client on for companion care, usually the clients do not improve. They usually start to decline, which means maybe in the beginning, you didn't have to touch them or assist them with bathing and dressing. But as time goes on, you do have to do that. And then if you're just a companion sitter agency, you're out of your scope of practice. So just as a business person, I feel if you're going to be in this business, you should get the in-home aid license so that when you get that client, you get to keep them all the way to the end. And that would be whether they pass away, go to the nursing home or move, whatever it is. So that is the best option for you. However, if you have to start it as a companion sitter agency, it allows you to get your feet wet and learn what you're doing. And then you can, here in the state of North Carolina, you can add the in-home aid part later by submitting new policies and procedures. And then I think a couple of you mentioned right from the beginning, the pay. The aides are requesting a pretty high rate now because they know that they're in demand. So that is something you really have to consider and so that make, makes you have to charge your clients a certain amount because you've got to cover your expenses, taxes, all of that, and then have a, a profit for the business. So it really makes you wonder if they don't call you back or don't finish your paperwork, was that person really someone that you wanted to put with the client because it, they didn't consider getting the hiring process completed? So would they have been loyal and um, would you have had enough confidence in them to do their job if you hired them? 
health care. I think that's something they are talking about in Congress, but, you know, it's unwrapped now. But I still just think that there has to be a come to Jesus moment that's a, where someone says, hey, we need to to make these jobs, um, to incentivize these jobs a little more so that people that are at home who need the care can get it. Yeah, it's in every industry. Well, I have said before, I think one of the solutions for home care, and I don't know if it'll fill all the gaps, is we're going to have to go after people that are not part of this industry. And I think before I told you all, there are some people that have, quote, retired, and they just want a little something to do, and they're philanthropic also. They want to help people. They may be in the local sorority. They may be in different clubs, but people like that, that are a little bit older, say between 55 and 65, they're healthy. Those are people that you can seek to maybe work part time. Mm -hmm. They're not going to want to work 40 hours a week and you're not going to put them with a client that is a, a quote, a bed patient that needs a lot of help, but they can fill in a lot of holes for you. I used a lot of people like that with my agency. I made sure that I put them in a job where they didn't get hurt or it was a job that they could do. And it worked out very well. But as the person making the assignments, the nurse or the service supervisor, you, you have to really look out for those older employees and make sure that you're putting them in the right job. Just like you're looking out for your clients, you have to look out for their health and well-being for bonuses and like she said shift differential mm -hmm. um may can get you know them in the door but if you know that you're paying a, a really good rate there's only so high you can go exactly. yes, yes you have to have a lot of volume to cover that a whole lot of clients hours and uh, employees okay i'm going to go on to the next one then I looked at some of the client considerations. It looks like right now, you all, that there is really not an issue with getting clients or acquiring clients. I'm seeing now that the clients are out there. It's just finding the employees to cover them. Okay, yes. Yeah, so that's, and you know, as this area grows here in, in North, in the whole state of North Carolina, we're in an area where we're one of the highest retirement states in the country. So as these people move here, when they retire, some of them, of them are moving here because their kids went to college here, stayed here, own businesses, work here. So we're getting more and more clients in the area that need help. But I don't know that our base of employees that we need to cover them is keeping up with that, the client. And then something that I found that could sort of hurt an agency is that if your aides do not practice confidentiality, and we know in healthcare, we're under the HIPAA law. We can't talk about our clients or what we do or don't do for them. But some of these aides really need to be taught that they can't talk about one client to the other, or you know they can't tell somebody's business to a person, even if the person doesn't know them. Because if if they're at a client's house talking to the client, well, you know, I was working for this lady over in Nightdale and she needed this, 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 and this. Then that person, even though they don't know them, they're going to immediately think, well, when you leave my house, you're talking about me too. Mm -hmm. So I would find from time to time, I would have to go back to my aides. I had them sign a form, a confidentiality HIPAA form. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had things in there like, you know, don't talk about one client to the other. All of the things that really related to them, because the big, huge HIPAA document, there's so much in there. So I went in isolated things that I thought were important, like mm -hmm. don't get on the phone in front of a client and talk about another client. Just whatever. Just make sure you think of all of the ways that they can breach a client's confidentiality when they're really not thinking about it. So this is really important. Uh, and your clients, they notice it, you know, for sure. And some of them may leave your agency because of that. And when they do, they'll tell others. As far as your billing rates for your services, we just talked quite a bit about what you pay your aides. So you want to have your rates 
consistent with the industry, the area that you're in. So I have given a few tips to my clients. I tell them that you need to find out what your competitors are charging. So my suggestion is that you find out from your competitors by calling them and you may have to pose as a client mm -hmm. or you may have to get someone else to do that for you. But you need to know, you need to know what, what the agency next door down the street is charging. And then you don't want to be the highest and you don't want to be the lowest. You want to be somewhere in between mm -hmm. whatever that range is. Now I have been told yeah, this is for private pay because we know Medicaid has their standard rate and you have to take whatever they give you, but you, you want to know what that number is. No. So this is really important because when they get a rate from you and they call, all other people, they're counting on you to, to stay at that rate. So you've got to mm -hmm. be accurate with this. That's why you need that number. And when they call you and ask for services, if your rates are $22, you need to stay that, say that number and stand on it until it's time for a rate change. And then talking about that, the, whenever I change my rates, I would try to notify my existing clients 60 mm -hmm. to 90 days in advance. Mm -hmm. Like if I was going to raise my rates in October, I would let my clients know now. I would send them a letter and let them know as of October 1st, the hourly rate is such and such. That way it's not a surprise. They have time to plan for it. And I've never had a client to leave the agency because of the rate. If you're doing a good job and you've got the right person in there and you're responding to that client, they don't like change either. Once they get used to you and people that you send into their homes that are doing a good mm -hmm. job, they won't leave. But be reasonable with your increases. Make sure you know what others are charging and you stay within that range. Okay, and I just mentioned making sure you respond to the clients. How do you, how do you handle your clients' issues and complaints? As your agency starts to grow, you're going to probably be on the phone a lot because if you get a complaint from a client, they call you to say, my aide is late or she fell asleep, whatever it is that went on or um, just what, whatever, she's not doing this properly. The dishes weren't clean. The, the clothes weren't dry or, or whatever. You need to stop and handle those issues right away. You need to handle that client's concern. If they call you and say, I need to talk to you about something, you call them back. Sometimes they just want you to listen mm -hmm. and know that you care about what's going on. Of course, you need to fix it with the, with the aid. And a lot of times it may not completely be just the aid's fault. The client may have some input also you know, they may have told her, you know, don't let that dry run but 30 minutes. And that may not be long enough to get the clothes dry. So there's, you just need, you're always going to be a mediator. You're going to be between that client and that aide. And you need to find a way to treat both of them well. Make sure that everybody knows I'm not going to be on this side. Whoever's wrong, they need to know that they're wrong or if they need to compromise that's going to be a big part of your job is you're going to be a major negotiator with keeping that balance because the, this business is you have two big areas that you're constantly balancing, your clients and your employees, and they both have to be happy to make this work. So that's just to be expected. And if you learn good negotiating skills, you have good rules and expect people to follow them that will help you a lot along the way. Okay. And then one of the other things is just making sure that your agency is staying um, within the compliance guidelines for your licensure. For those of you not in the state of North Carolina here, all of our agencies are licensed, at least they're supposed to be. And so there's certain rules that you need to follow. And these are some of the areas that they're noticing that agencies are having trouble following. 
HCPR, that's healthcare personnel reporting. That is when one of your workers does something in the field that is a reportable offense. There is a list of offenses that you're supposed to report. If you get a complaint from a client and they say that the aid fell asleep, that may be something you need to report because it's a safety issue. You need to have a complaint log. When complaints come in, they need to be on a log. You need to log those and make sure that if it's on that complaint log and if it's something that one of your people did, say if um, the client says she went to the store to purchase groceries and didn't bring my change back, oh, it was the wrong change. That will be a reportable mm-hmm. offense. You know, you talk first, you talk to the aide and you try to resolve it because it may be that she was like, oh, that was, you know, I, for, I just forgot to give it to her. It was in my pocket. But most clients aren't going to call you until they try to work it out with the aide. But you do a good investigation of that situation within the agency because you only have 24 hours to do an initial report. And then you have five days to do another report and send it in. And this is where the agencies are getting in trouble. They're not following the 24 hour guideline and the five day report guideline. So just make sure you look in your policies and procedures and see what those time frames are and that you follow it and that if it is something that needs to be reported, that it gets reported. I hope this never happens to any of you, but if it does follow through, because when the client complains to you and they don't get a satisfactory result, they can report directly through the complaint line that's part of your policies and procedures. And once they report it, then um, DHSR will send out an investigator and they're gonna look at all of your internal procedures to be sure that you have followed all of that to resolve the situation. And just making sure your care plans need to be specific. And I don't know how many nurses are on the line, but every ADL, bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, and ambulation, they need to have a level of assistance that's required for that client. Is it supervisory, independent, extensive assistance, limited assistance, or total assistance? The nurse needs to indicate what the level of assistance is. And in turn, that information is used to determine what level of in-home aid they need to have. Does she need to be on the nurse aid registry or can she just be a regular in-home aid that's not on the registry? And there's other parameters there. If it's more than two ADLs with extensive assistance, then they need someone that's on the registry. So your nurse, really needs to be trained in this because she's determining that. Also, when she goes out to do her 90-day supervisory visits, if the status has changed, that needs to be indicated. And there will be times when you need to replace the aid if that client's level of assistance has changed in any of those ADLs. So just keep that in mind. That's a lot to pay attention to, but it is one that you can really get behind the eight ball if you don't have your nurses watching that at all times. Okay, it depends on how that RN wrote that care plan. And if she indicated that more than two of those ADLs require extensive assistance, then if you have a PCA, which is what you call it, but here in North Carolina, they like to say they're on the nurse aid registry or they're not on the registry. But we know what you mean. You mean someone that's not on the registry, correct? Right. Then you really are outside of you know your scope if that person continues to work there. If that sometimes it might be a temporary thing and then the client, mm-hmm. you know, gets better. But if it is permanent, you just need to make every effort to have someone that is on the registry. You don't count. And you'll see a lot of that. I used to see that all the time. The aides would come in and they were like, oh yeah, I used to, I used to be a CNA and I would check the registry and see it. And I was, I was like, why did you let it expire? 
Well, usually they went to work for someone under private pay for two or three years. You know, they directly contracted with a family. And you all, just to refresh your memory, in order for them to stay on the nurse aid registry, they have to work under the supervision of an RN at least eight hours during the past two year period, which is when they're, they renew every two years. So if an aide gets a really good job with the family and they go and take care of, you know, Miss Jones's mother for the next three years, then their, their registry will expire because they weren't working under an RN. And so that's why you're seeing those people. It's not that they don't have experience anymore. So the same rules apply. You'll even have situations where, say the client did not need a lot of help in the beginning, you put the right person in there and then their status changed. Well, that age changed right along with them. Even though Miss Jones didn't need that much help with putting her clothes on three months ago and now she needs help, that person has adapted they know how to do it. They can perform every skill. But now Miss Jones needs, you know, she has more that she has extensive assistance needs in three areas. So now she needs a certified aid. So really you should get her a different aid, even though her the person she has can perform everything. So that's why this is such a great area and this is so tough for agencies. Y'all just stay on top of that so that um, if it ever comes up, you're in compliance. But I know this area is tough. I've experienced it. What I started doing is I would have people come in and um, fill out all their paperwork. Their interview was perfect. And I had a lot of what you're talking about, too. So I started asking them at the end when we were interviewing and talking, I would say, is there anything on your background check that you that I need to know about? You know, go ahead and tell me now. Some would, some would not. So that's just a cost of doing business. I've, I've had some to come in. I mean, the most beautiful, kindest person, you know, everything looked good and I really wanted to hire them. And then I get a report and they've been, you know, they had an altercation. and Bell of you. <laughs> yes. So I know exactly what y'all are saying, but that is just a cost of doing business. You're still going to mm -hmm. have to screen them because, you know, they may tell you, they may not tell you the truth. So you're going to have to pull that background check. And so hopefully you don't have to do as many, but try to get them to tell you up front. And then a, an extension of that is if you ask them if they have something on their background check, do you need to know about it? If they say yes, maybe say this, has it ever prevented you from getting a job someplace before? Mm -hmm. There are some things that they've done that you can't hire them. You know, like if it was drug diversion, fraud, there's certain things there uh -huh. that are on a list that you, no matter when it was, you can't hire them. Really? But yes, but some of the things that you're talking about, they may, you know, come off, you know, like you say, it should be purged. It's not purged, but you know, they were 19 when they were driving without a license or, you know, mm -hmm. they had some beer in the car and now they're 45. Yeah, well, and, no, ma'am. And, you know, uh, not every agency might. That's one of the things that they're uh, that's on the list of compliance is that they are noticing that some agencies are not running background checks. They keep finding that when they go out and do audits. So you may have run into one of those people that nobody actually got around to doing their background check or didn't mm -hmm. intend to you know, do this. Also, y'all, just think about, make sure your policies and procedures are up to date. I don't think there's anybody on the line that's been in business longer than before 2018, but there was a major change in all the home care licensure rules in North Carolina in 2018. There's quite a few agencies out there that were in business when that change was made that have not updated their policies and procedures. So if you get a complaint or something happens and they come in and do a survey, that's the first thing they're going to look at. 
because um, more than likely, if you didn't update the policies and procedures, then you're not following the new policy. Like it used to be that the care plan uh, only had to be signed by the nurse. Now the care plan has to be signed by the nurse and the uh, client or responsible party. So if they come in and see that only the nurse is signing, they're going to look at your policies and they're going to be like, no, this was changed. There should also be a client signature on here. So mm -hmm. just be sure that, you know, you all should be fine. All of you, I believe, started after the changes came through. But as they make changes, you all make sure you update your policies and procedures and that you implement it in your day-to-day -day work. The, when you have a license and they're gonna make a major change to the um, license that you operate under or the policies and procedures, they usually send you probably now their email and everything, or they used to send us a letter. Okay. And tell you that this change was adopted. Usually before a change is made, they put it out there for comment. If you've seen any of that, they'll say, we're looking at making this change. They allow the public and the providers to comment. And then mm -hmm. it goes through a process. And when it finally becomes effective, they let you know what those changes were. So stay mm -hmm. on top of those. If you get any mail or emails from DHHS or DHSR, look at that to be sure you know when a change has been made. But they do let you know. Um, are you, you all, if you're doing Medicaid under NC tracks, you should be getting a lot of emails from them. So make sure you check your emails or anything that comes from, you know, DHSR or the state, open that mail and make sure you pay attention to what's in there. It is my understanding that people working in home care, when you tell them what time to go to work, what time to get off, which we do, they are not a 1099 employee. They should be on a W-2. North Carolina, and I'm sure in your area, you do not have to let the state know what you're charging your private pay clients. Mm -hmm. The state will let you know what they're paying under Medicaid oh. if you're getting Medicaid, but there's no nothing written anywhere, especially here, that you have to let the state know. If you want to, if your clients will allow you to charge them, you have no reporting structure there for okay. letting the state know what your private rate is. And I would, I don't think you would have that in your state. You can verify that though. Okay, here in here in North Carolina, Medicaid pays the one flat rate for the work that the aides do. And so you have to have your pay structured so that you somehow are able to pay your nurses out of that. There is no separate fee just for your nurse assessment or supervisory visit in North Carolina. Someone asked a question, um, are people using benefit coordinators to collect from insurance companies, in-house staff or third party vendors? Now, um, Yolanda, when I build the insurance companies, I just build them directly by sending them, you know, the invoice from my company and following up and, and getting that money. So I hope that answers the question. Um, when your agency is small, you know, you really can't have that many extra people doing one thing. An office staff person should be able to do that for you. you know about private pay sources. Well, your main private pay source is going to be the client themselves. And then some have long-term care insurance. Also, VA will, um, you can get paid through VA, but some of the VA people will, a veteran may choose to get extra money in their paycheck each month for something called aid and attendance services. And so that client, the the veteran will pay you directly for what you do for them. So um, those, so the private, the main private pay source is that client writing you a check. Now, when they have long-term care insurance, there is a way that you can have the long-term care insurance pay you directly for your services, but the client has to approve that. 
they sign a paper called an assignment of benefit. And that means that your agency can submit those invoices directly to the insurance company with all the documentation and the check comes to you. Or if the client chooses not to do that, they can have the check come to them after you submit the paperwork and then they write you a check. But I always like to get it where the insurance company sent the check to me because I got it a little bit quicker. It already takes the insurance companies about 30 days to pay. And if it has to go to the client and, you know, then you have to get paid, then you're delayed even further. So if your client will agree to do assignment of benefit, you want to do that. And most of the clients liked it because they were like, you know, I have so much to worry about. The caregiver would say, I have to worry about doing this, this and this for my husband. So if, if I have to can get out of the way of that payment from the insurance company, then I'll sign this paper so I don't have that extra administrative duty. The insurance companies have their own electronic visit verification. And that's the first I've heard of yes. that because that's what you yes. all are doing with Medicaid. That's electronic visit verification. So she's saying that the insurance companies are doing that. And I'm sure that if River Source is doing that, and that's a very effective system, it sounds like, there's probably others doing it. I did not experience that when I was in business. It's what we're talking about, electronic visit, where the aides go and they clock in, clock out, and then the software can do the billing. I will say, uh, Kate, that here in North Carolina, the state has chosen a company called San Data, S-A-N-D-A-T-A. And they have solutions beyond what they offer for Medicaid. So that's one company that I know North Carolina vetted 12 or 13 companies and came up with them. Well, thank you all so